Welcome to the Talent Equation Podcast. If you are passionate about helping young people to unleash their potential and want to find ways to do that better, then you've come to the right place. The Talent Equation Podcast seeks to answer the important questions facing parents, coaches, and talent developers as they try to help young people become the best they can be. This is a series of unscripted, unpolished conversations between people at the razor's edge of the talent community who are prepared to share their knowledge, experiences, and challenges in an effort to help others get better faster. Listen, reflect, and don't forget to join the discussion at thetalentequation.co.uk. Enjoy the show. Well, I'm, I'm uh, really excited to have uh, Dan Peterson and uh, Len Zajkowski. Uh, Len, have I pr- present, pronounced that right? You're here spot on. We got it. Good, good. I did actually get a little bit of help from Dan before you came on, so I cheated a little bit. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to the show. Um, uh, I'm, I'm excited to talk about uh, the new book that you've got out, The Playmaker's Advantage. It's definitely the sort of thing that's that's in, in my wheelhouse in terms of conversations. But before we jump into all of that, um, I wonder if uh, maybe, Dan, you could start, maybe give us a little bit of your background and kind of how you arrived at the book. And then uh, once Dan's done, Len, jump in there and uh, and give us a bit of your background as well. Sure, I'd be happy to, Stuart. And, and thanks for the invite to be on the podcast. We've listened to several episodes and, and always enjoy them. Um, so I am the non-practitioner in the group, and I know that's different from a lot of your guests mm-hmm. and different from Len. Um, so I spent my career in health information technology, working in hospitals, et cetera, but I'm a sports dad and I raised, my wife and I raised three boys. Uh, they're all in their twenties now, but they played sports growing up, uh, mainly soccer, uh, but some baseball and hockey as well. And so I've been interested in the, for the last 10 to 15 years in watching them grow, watching them go through all their different teams, a variety of coaches, coaching styles, et cetera. And just as a parent and observing uh, how they learn, how they pick up certain things. And throughout that, from the young ages up through high school and even into college sports, I've noticed there's always these certain players that uh, have different names in different sports, uh, the field general, the, the, the uh, uh, player who has field vision, uh, court sense, etc. And they've, these are the players who always seem to have a better vision of the field. They make things happen out there. They see passes that maybe others don't. And I've always been fascinated with the brain and how those young brains work out there on the field or the court and understanding the perception, the decision-making, the skill acquisition, et cetera, that they, that they have to go through to accomplish what they do. And, and for me as a parent to appreciate what they do out there. And so this has just been a, a kind of a side hobby of mine for several years. I started a blog about eight years ago called 80percentmental.com. And I would just read research articles, interpret them the best I can, and write about them. So it's just been a learning journey of mine. And it culminated a couple years ago when I told my wife, you know, I'd really like to write a book on this stuff. And after she kind of uh, said, well, okay, what do you know about this stuff? And I said, well, enough that I could probably uh, put together something. And so I uh, went through the whole process of, okay, finding out how to write a book and doing a book proposal and finding an agent and all of those things. And I tell the story about the uh, the first agent that got back to me, who actually is our agent today. Uh, she was very kind, but she said, Dan, I, I love the concept of the book and I like your writing, but uh, in the nonfiction world, you need some credibility. You need to, you need an author who, who actually is an expert in this stuff uh, for a publisher or, or a reading audience to be interested. And uh, she said, do you know anybody like that? And I said, well, actually, I do. I'd I'd started working with a few sports science companies, writing articles for them, doing some marketing for them. And I had met Dr. Lynn Zykowski. 
and I'll let Len tell you his background in bio, but basically 40 years of experience as a professor at Boston University, known around the world, uh, working with many different teams at all different levels. And I asked Len, uh, who's recently retired to Florida, I said, uh, I called him up and I said, Len, would you be interested in writing a book with me? And he was very gracious and said, actually, I would. And uh, I'll, I'll let him explain more of his reaction. But to make a long story short, uh, two years ago, or actually 18 months ago, we signed a publishing contract and, uh, and we put the book out in June in the U.S. And it's, uh, it's being released in the U.K. on August 9th by Simon & Schuster. Uh, it's, it was released, it's being released on August 1st in Australia. And uh, it's really just a dream come true for me to, to get this book out. And obviously, uh, Len was a big part of that with his network of contacts and his years of experience. So I'll let him take it from there. Okay, thanks, uh, Stuart, again. Uh, a pleasure to be with you and kind of share our information with you and your audience. Um, I, I had an interesting career development. There are many I took uh, uh, you know, many forks in the road, and I always happen to choose the right one so far. Uh, I, I grew up in Western Canada, uh, in Northern Alberta, and uh, it was a wonderful place to grow up and play sports, uh, every conceivable sport. We played in the summertime, mostly baseball, a uh, little bit of soccer, uh, a lot of hockey in the wintertime. And... Uh, at a very young age, uh, I aspired to be a teacher and a coach. That was that was my objective. I was a pretty good athlete in both hockey and, and baseball. Uh, did a lot of other things, uh, track and field. Loved to do track and field events. Uh, and so that was that was kind of my life. And so off to the University of Alberta, uh, I went uh, to, to study physical education uh, to be a teacher and a coach. And I had a great mentor, one of the early pioneer sports psychologist, so before we called it sports psychology, uh, uh, Murray Smith, who at that time did not have his doctorate, but coached multiple sports at the university, he was a wonderful pedagogue. He just emphasized the importance of great teaching, because uh, that's what coaching is all about. And uh, he really impressed me with that concept. Uh, unfortunately, Murray just passed away here a couple of months ago at 93, uh, and I did, uh, Pay tribute to him in the book as a, having a tremendous influence on my life. A pedagogue, a wonderful coach, and a great sports psychologist. Uh, so uh, after graduating, I got a wonderful job in a small town called Stetler, Alberta, in the middle of the province. It was a sport crazy town. I, I could continue to play a fairly good level of hockey and baseball, but had the opportunity to coach nearly every sport, uh, uh, young men and young women. Uh, mostly at the high school level. Uh, then I realized as a young coach that in our training, we received a lot of uh, knowledge about the physiology, human performance, and, and fitness components, but so little about uh, the psychology of performance. So I felt that I could really be a great coach uh, and, and, and a better teacher if I studied psychology in depth. So. Off I went to the University of Oklahoma to work on my master's degree, uh, and I was able to pursue that uh, uh, emphasis on psychology of performance. And in those days, it was mostly around skill, what we, today we call skill acquisition, and uh, motor learning and motor development. Um, uh, and I, was, I found out that I was pretty good at the, the academic component of, <laughs> of uh, uh, this field and uh, got influenced by a professor at the University of Oklahoma to go get a PhD, which at that time I didn't know what it was. And so uh, I was able to kind of get funding to go to the University of Toledo that had an interdisciplinary program that, emphasized, that allowed me to work in my, my field of passion for sport, uh, but also to do an in-depth study of psychology. Uh, I also thought it was important to understand the brain. So I spent a year at the medical school studying uh, what was called at that time neuroanatomy. Today it's called neuroscience. But I thought everybody should be doing that, having a, an understanding of the brain and how, uh, what effect it has on uh, our thought processes and our motor skill acquisition. Um, so that was my uh, uh, entry into into this field. And of course, 
uh, by getting a PhD, it, it kind of dries up the, the, the old high school teaching position and was off to uh, higher education. And Boston University happened to have a one-year appointment. I decided to accept it. And it turned into 38 wonderful years where I had the opportunity to start uh, a graduate program in sports psychology. We were first housed in human movement, uh, which was a uh, uh, strong emphasis on, on sport and sports science. But uh, uh, later on, I, I, I knew that it was going to be important if I was going to, to head up a sports psychology program. There was a, a big shift going on towards uh, uh, credentialing as a psychologist and uh, uh, having expertise in mental health issues as well. Uh, so I started to go in that direction. And part of that was kind of fueled by my intense interest in using biofeedback, uh, kind of the whole psychophysiology of self-regulation of human stress and performance. Uh, so I, I got into the clinical world much more and then ultimately uh, created one of the first programs in North America uh, in sports psychology and performance that uh, uh, was housed in a counseling department in counseling psychology. And that continued until uh, uh, I retired. But it was a, a wonderful journey that uh, uh, allowed me to not only train a lot of graduate students uh, to be outstanding in their field, but to consult around the world with high performance sports and with kids, that's where my passion still is, uh, to make them better performers, develop expertise. Uh, so that was kind of the, the long journey. And I'm gonna kind of conclude now with <laughs> how do we get to this book? Well, Dan's right, he called me on this. And I often thought about doing this. I published a number of textbooks, but uh, uh, that along with my lectures probably had very minimal impact on the world in general on my thoughts on, on the importance of, of uh, cognition in human performance. So uh, uh, writing a trade book like we did, uh, The Play Vegas Advantage, gave me the opportunity to continue being an educator uh, on something that I think is crucially important. And uh, Dan and I are both hopeful that other people around the world will find, will, will believe that, that, that we have really overlooked the importance of what we're calling cognition in uh, athlete performance. So that's my journey. Wow. Um, well, thank you both for uh, thank you both for the kind of background and uh, and the story. I mean, it's uh, some some rich experiences. And what I kind of love about your collaboration is the fact that. Um, you know, uh, whilst, you know, Dan, you're coming from a kind of background, having worked in the sort of technology space and then just, you know, having this kind of passionate interest and, and sort of, you know, your own learning and study. And that resonates with me because it's definitely the, the journey I've been on with, with my blog and, and the podcast as well. And then sort of combining that with, you know, that lens background in both the applied sense, but also in that kind of psych psychological research. It's a, it's a powerful, uh, powerful collaboration. And uh, that's, that's certainly coming across in the, uh, in what you've produced. As a starting point, I suppose, um, one of the questions I'd, I have to kick off with is, um, I like to think of myself as, I, I think I think of myself as a bit of a playmaker. Now, I, I've always thought that this was partly due to the fact that I, I was born with a, a physical impairment. I had uh, had some problems with uh, with my feet at, at birth that had to be corrected, and it left me with sort of some deficiencies in uh, in in my um, uh, muscular muscular musculoskeletal uh, area in, in my legs. So I was always a little bit a little bit slower than most people, a lot slower, actually. Um, but my adaptation, I felt, was that I, I always had to be uh, ahead of others in terms of the way I thought. So I was always looking around and becoming quite analytical. It took me on a journey to coaching, I think, because I'm always trying to find the next step. What's the performance out? What are the opponents doing? How, where, are my oppo where are my teammates? How can I link around? What can I see? What can, I, what can give me an advantage to, get, to help overcome the, the lack of speed that I've got? So I've always thought of myself as one of my, my abilities, I suppose, as a, as a performer was this ability to almost be a couple of steps ahead of everybody else and, and see the pass maybe before somebody else. Um, so that's what I think of when I think of as this idea of a playmaker. H how are you guys talking about the concept of a playmaker? I think, uh, yeah, I I think, you're, start that off. I think you're, you're, you're pretty well spot on. That, that, that was our, our position on that, although we did ask. 
uh, every interviewee, the, the coaches we talked to, the elite coaches, uh, and or the players, uh, and even in some cases, uh, uh, academics and other writers, uh, to define the playmaker. Again, that did that throughout the book. But uh, yes, you're right. Uh, these, my conception, and Dan can probably elaborate on that, is that, that they're like you describe yourself. You, you had to, you, uh, had to use your, uh, and be quick on your feet. <laughs> I saw that the other day. What is quick on your feet is an English expression. Of course, it's a wonderful expression, but it doesn't mean that your your quickness on your feet, but it's rather quickness in your uh, prefrontal cortex that's uh, making the difference. So they just you, you, you think the game a little bit differently. And of course, if, if you think the game differently and you have incredible physical attributes and and uh, endurance, you're going to be this world class performer. Uh, so Dan, you may want to add to that too, but let me add one other thing here as we, we talked about an introduction. One of the other things that we should have ended with is that in our, in our teaming up with Dan, uh, is, is, as you well know, you come from an academic world, you write in, in peer-reviewed journals and uh, using a whole scientific vocabulary that uh, most people just get bored of. And that's how I learned to write. That writing is very different than writing books like this, a, a trade book. Uh, and Dan is a great story writer, a wonderful writer. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, uh, as, as our audience tunes in here, I think they'll appreciate kind of the, 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 Dan's ability to write in story form, something I could not do. So that kind of contributed to our partnership. Thanks, Len. I appreciate that. And, you know, you're right, Stuart. It, it, that's exactly as you described. When we uh, talked about the book and the concept of the book, you know, we wanted to focus on the cognitive side of playing sports. And as Len knows, has, having done both traditional sports psychology and performance psychology, um, you, we knew there were a lot of quality books out there on the traditional forms of sports psychology topics, motivation and attitude and confidence. Certainly very important, but a lot of good books already out there. We wanted to focus on the, the brain's role from a cognitive skills standpoint, the perception, the awareness, the reaction time, the decision making and and dive into that much deeper in terms of what is the research that's out there there's a, a lot of very good research being done out there about this uh, but I don't think we didn't think it was getting out to the coaches and getting out to the parents and so we tried to produce a book that was a bridge there that all of this great work that was being done by sports science researchers cognitive science researchers but the takeaways and the lessons from all of those papers were not necessarily getting out to, especially here in the U.S., to everyday parents and coaches, and that would affect their coaching styles, would affect how parents uh, see their kids out on the field, et cetera. So that was kind of the goal. But as Len said, one of the, if you talk too long about the brain and cognitive science, uh, people's eyes start to glass over. So we thought, well, what's up? What's a term? What's a concept that's kind of universal that people have heard? And we thought about the word playmaker because most people, as we talked about, most people understand what that player is out on the field, whether it be, and we're talking mainly in the book about team invasion based sports, basketball, soccer, uh, rugby, um, hockey, et cetera. And they know who that player is. And that's what we, we wanted to focus on that. So it's not specifically about that player, but it's about those types of skills that they have. And I think it's, you know, coaches are starting to realize that those skills are important and then actually could be the next generation of competitive advantage is understanding that. And I'll tell one quick story. Um, early on when, when Len and I were talking about the book and organizing it, et cetera, and I sent Len a, a link to a YouTube video. And I said, Len, check this out. It's Mike Sullivan, you know, former head coach in the NHL. Uh, this is when before he was with the Pittsburgh Penguins. And uh, he was giving a coaching seminar to probably 250, 300 uh, hockey coaches at a USA Hockey coaching symposium here in the U.S. And uh, there was a, a video of his talk. And he spent 45 minutes with these coaches talking about the brain. 
And he was talking about synapses and neurons and myelin sheaths and how people learn and the talent code and all of these things. And I was just amazed. I'm like, here is a professional, well-known hockey coach telling all of these up and coming hockey coaches, you need to pay attention to this stuff, guys. You need to learn some of this stuff because this is, this affects so much of what your players do and it affects how you coach them. And so uh, I told that to Len and of course, Len with his worldwide network, he said, Oh, Mikey. Yeah. He was a a student of mine at Boston university years ago and played (laughs) hockey here at Boston U. So I, I said, yeah, of course, you know him, Len, you know, everybody. (laughs) <laughs> and so uh, Len contacted him. We had a great interview with Coach Sullivan, who, of course, has gone on to win two Stanley Cups with the Pittsburgh Penguins and still with them today. Uh, but he and he actually is very, uh, very nice and wrote the foreword for the book. Uh, but he still continues to preach to coaches that y- you you know a lot about physical training. You know about uh, how to develop muscles and speed and endurance. You know the X's and O's of your sport, but you need to start to learn something about how your players learn at whatever age you're coaching. And you need to understand how that process goes on and what they're facing out in the field. And so that was kind of the, um, the impetus of the, of the playmaker part of the book. I, I like... Um... I, I, I like what you said there, actually, um, in the sense that I think some people might see the title of the book and think, oh, this relates to those players in those key positions who are, you know, who, who are generally relied upon. So, for example, uh, you know, in in American football, you would predominantly talk about people like the quarterback who are key decision making positions or mm-hmm. in rugby, sure, you have sure. You have the halfback, the, the you know the scrum half, the the fly half who make key decision making positions, et cetera, et cetera. You know, the, classically in in soccer, you've got the kind of what they call the number ten, you know, that kind of creative mm-hmm. player. But actually, what you're talking about in terms of a playmaker is actually a a set of qualities, attributes, skills, if you like, that all sports performers could and I would argue should have in order to help them navigate through the decision making moments that they might find themselves presented with in any game context so i'll go i'll go len to dan again um you know is that kind of how you're conceiving of this it's not necessarily position specific it's about the qualities that any sports person should be looking to develop in order to help them uh, perform absolutely you're, you're spot on with that and and we believe of course that it can be trained we it just the, the perception out there uh sport organization that this is something you either have or you don't have. And I was hoping that David Epstein's book on the sports dean would dispel that. But no, there's still that belief that only certain pe- people have that and it can't be developed. But uh, indeed, that's the case. And many of us as, as, as sports fans often get the wrong impression who the real playmaker is uh, on a team. And often, you know, and, and so the, the assumption oftentimes is that in the sport of basketball, for example, it's going to be the point guard. And so with uh, when we asked a uh, uh, Boston Celtics coach uh, in our wonderful interview with him, um, uh, talking about the point guard being the playmaker, he says, no, no, you guys, you got it wrong, you know? Uh, you know, uh, so he talked He talked about who his real playmaker was, and maybe Dan may want to expand upon that. He said it was Al, Al Horford, uh, and I knew he was a good player, but certainly I never thought that he was the playmaker, but from a distance, uh, we had the perception it's a point guard by position. And he said, no, you, you got it wrong. So he, he clarified that for us. And boy, we were very alert to it. It sensitized to us and who the real playmakers are. Uh, you know, as casual fans, we may not uh, be totally aware of it. In some cases, it's very obvious, like in, in professional football and in, in, in the National Football League and the New England Patriots, uh, clearly it's always Tom Brady. And we write a little bit about that as well and kind of, how he distinguishes himself as a playmaker. Yeah, I think that's right, Len. And, and um, as Brad Stevens told us, you know, it's it's the player who others look to. Uh, it's the player who has enough experience and, and insight that uh, they, they create opportunities for others. And so it could be any position. And I think, Stuart, that's where we get to the, the second word of the of the title, the playmaker, playmaker's advantage, almost saying, what is that advantage? What is that special something that those playmaker types have that perhaps we could learn more about and identify and not just say, well, you know, 
some kids have it, some don't, and, and we just hope to find the right ones. Well, maybe we can discover through looking at this uh, material what that advantage is and then try to understand it and, and uh, identify it and train others to have uh, similar capabilities. And as Len said earlier, when we, throughout all the interviews we did for the book, we'd always start one out with, you know, what is your definition of the playmaker? And we got a variety of, of answers. They're all similar uh, to the vein of they make the other players around them better, which is rather vague, but we, we try to spend the, most of the book trying to be more specific about that. But one quote we found that I thought was very interesting was um, Pep Guardiola being asked recently, probably in the last year, uh, about Kevin De Bruyne on Manchester City. And he had a line that, that I think sums it up very well. He said, he makes the right decision in the right moment every single time. And I thought that, that really summed it up well, that that's the kind of player we're looking for, and that's the kind of player we're describing, is how, and, and actually we break it down in the book into something called athlete cognition, and I'm jumping ahead a little here. But it's basically breaking down that cycle of, perceiving the opportunities out in the field, deciding which is the best one from their experience, and then executing the skill. And I think players go through that you know, hundreds of times a game at all levels, and they get better at, at it over time. But if we can improve that cycle, we call it search, decide, and execute. Um, if they can improve those aspects, and they're all combined into one, and then it keeps cycling over and over. Um, if the practices, if the drills, et cetera, reinforce that. And as you've, as you've done a lot of, Stuart, in your work is teaching creativity. And I think there's a lot of crossovers between what we're talking about and what you talk about with creativity. Uh, um, I, I mean, there's a, there's a lot in there. I mean, one of the things I was interested in is, um, uh, I mean, if you take, say, for example, the New Zealand All Blacks, I think one of the things that marks out them as a, as a team or as an organization that, that is very, very difficult to defeat is um, that their the players, regardless of position, and each position has its own requirements and what have you, but each of the players on the team has some of the capabilities of a playmaker in the sense that if they are presented with a problem that a defender or group of defenders is presenting, they either individually or collectively can come to a decision that will give them the best possible opportunity to, uh, to, to, to navigate that challenge and to solve that problem and then for them, for them to be uh, successful. And so I'm kind of wondering whether our aspiration here in terms of, I mean, and also just going back to when I was working uh, within uh, English rugby for, for the uh, English rugby union. Um, one of the things we looked at doing for quite some time was getting some, uh, is to sort of say when kids are like, you know, seven, eight, nine going, you know, starting early in rugby that we don't say, right, you're the scrum half and you, you know, we give them into positions too early because we wanted all the kids to have exposure to areas where they would be required to make different types of decisions um, so that they're all getting the opportunity to be in the kinds of positions that ask them those kinds of questions more often and therefore we can potentially develop these kinds of playmaker uh, qualities within them. So I'm just interested to get your thoughts on that really around the idea of the qualities of a playmaker being available to every player whilst yes you usually have the kind of the totem or the go-to individual but those qualities being developable in all sports people and then that that being a, a potential uh, route to success for sports organizations if i could start with that you're, you're so right on with uh, describing how uh, the training of young uh, uh, athletes in any particular team sport uh, and, and that is to play a variety of positions uh, it, 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 it's similar to the other notion that we dealt with the early specialization of kids in sport where every athlete and coach we talked to just frowned on that and yet many parents don't don't buy into it they want their kids to specialize at an early age in a particular sport but what you're talking about here is that within a given sport once you get in there uh, sample all the different playing positions because who knows where you might really a position you might be really good at mm. and uh, 
put yourself in the, above all the important decision making uh, uh, positions uh, because every every position has a slightly different uh, set of requirements for the kinds of decisions that have to be made. And so it's wonderful for a youngster to experience that at a very young age. And too often, uh, coaches really prevent that from happening. You're right on about that. And I think in the same way, uh, especially in youth sports here in the U.S., um, there is a lot of focus on selecting players who are physically uh, superior at whatever age they're being evaluated at. They're faster, they're taller, they're bigger, et cetera. They get chosen for the, the advanced teams, the select teams. And of course, and then the, the smaller uh, players are left behind. And I think one of the arguments too is in that playmaker realm, uh, in addition to uh, tests of skill and drills based on physical size and superiority, uh, what could we develop that brings out the mental side, the cognitive side, how can we evaluate the cognitive side of some of these players and say, you know, we were uh, we were just talking with Dr. Gary Klein yesterday, who's done a lot of wonderful research on decision making under pressure. And we were talking about the World Cup and we were talking about Modric and how he carried Croatia through the World Cup. And, you know, all of these examples of him or uh, uh, <laughs> any of the five, nine or under group who have that special ability, have that playmaking ability, have that ability to organize a team. Yet in a lot of youth sports cultures, they may be the ones who are weaned out early because they're just diminutive in size. And so if there's a way that coaches early on can identify some of those skills and say, yeah, he's small or she's small, but uh, he has a vision that that others don't and we should learn to develop that and actually that's a really good um kind of segue to a, another part of my question which is so a lot of the people who uh who listen to um uh, the podcast um one of the reasons i think they, they they kind of tune in is because um what they're listening to is people at the coal face trying to work out the how uh, because it's you know it's not a it's not an exact science you know they talk about it being an, an art form coaching I'm not 100% sure whether I, I'm convinced it's an art form but I think it's certainly a craft and um, as a result you know it's it's constantly improving we're finding different ways we're we're, in, we're we're working all the all the time and we're dealing with human beings so it's very difficult to be exact in terms of uh, the, the scientific information but based on on the stuff that that you guys you know the body of research and 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 also the the people that you spoke to i'm really interested in sort of drilling into some of the how you know if this is a developable um uh quality let's say uh, or these are developable skills then how might uh, a coach go about helping young people to develop these capabilities Well, I guess I'll that lead off on this one, uh, uh, Stuart. Uh, some of this is already being done. Uh, for instance, the tight area drills in, in soccer, uh, uh, it accomplishes several things. And I was observing a, a soccer training session in Australia back in March and, and at Manly, at the Manly Club, which has youth right through the pros. And uh, they were doing some tight area drills. And I asked the coaches after, uh, as I said, I was impressed with your tight area drills. And so what benefits do you see from it? And the, the coach said, it was just kind of one explanation. Well, the kids get more touches on the ball. <laughs> and uh, so I tried to quiz them a little bit more on, well, doesn't it also speed up their necessity of making quicker and more accurate decisions? Aren't we doing, aren't we training that as well? I never quite thought of it that way, he said, but uh, yeah, you're probably right. So I think some of this is already being done, and, but oftentimes, particularly the young coaches, don't know why they're doing it. It's got everything to do with uh, training the cognitive system to make quicker decisions, to, to look for cues, and, and you're just forced to make those decisions. So that's, that's one particular set of drills that's already being done, and they do it in ice hockey as well, these tight area drills. I remember start when I was coaching my sons and others in our community, uh, folks thought I was crazy. You know, what's this got to do with the game of ice hockey? These little tight little area girls. Well, 
even at that time, I thought the training the mind was really important. So uh, we're doing some of that stuff. We, we've got a lot of creative coaches out there. We, if we just ask them, we just ask them to think of it, what kinds of things could you do? Uh, how could you design your practices uh, to simulate game situations where they have to make quick decisions? And I think they could be creative if they're kind of forced into doing that rather than doing kind of routine kinds of, of, of drills uh, for skill acquisition, skill development. We have to also acquire skills, skills in, in the cognitive domain as well. The other area, maybe we can talk about that later on, but I just want to introduce it at this point. I think Dan can expand upon this. Is the advent of technology. Uh, and I've been a big techie person from day one. And uh, a lot of the, the uh, technology has been introduced to, to enhance performance, develop performance uh, physiologically, uh, et cetera. And some that ventured into the cognitive area, perceptual and cognitive area. And they have a tremendous amount of utility, in, in my opinion. Uh, and so that's another way of uh, uh, training the brain to perform better. But I'm, I don't want to continue to elaborate on that. I'd like to come revisit that uh, down the line. But Dan may want to add to what I've just said. Yeah, Stuart, it's a, it's a great question. And, and it was interesting when we when we brought the book proposal forward to a few publishers, et cetera, and so many, several of them wanted this to be a book, a very prescriptive book of, you know, almost here's 10 steps to make your son or daughter a playmaker. Mm -hmm. And we had to kind of explain to them that there is no perfectly right answer. There is no super drill that, that can do this. Um, one of the things that was interesting when we were talking to Dr. Klein yesterday, one of the things he stresses in his decision-making research of, of firefighters and, and others who are under pressure is that so much of what this talent is, the playmaker's advantage, is tacit knowledge that's been gained over many experiences, many situations. It's their ability to see patterns in the confusion, in the chaos, that maybe a less experienced person can't see those patterns and react to them and call upon them to make a better decision out in the field. And he said our, often our uh, response to that when we want to create better decision makers is we come up with procedures. You know, it's a, a coach who comes up with a, a series of if-then rules. You know, football is famous for this. You know, if you see this, do this. If you see that, do that. And coaches feel like they're active in training then because they're teaching them all these rules of how to, what to do when you see these situations. So you don't have to think too much out there. You just have to remember the rules. Uh, and he's saying what he sees from the people in the field who uh, are the best decision makers under pressure is that they're actually, they can't really use that explicit knowledge as much. They need to rely on that tacit knowledge that they've learned through a lot of different experiences. And so in a sports context, it's almost, as Len said, always put them in situations and practices where they need to be making decisions, whether it's small-sided games, whether it's other types of things, but reduce the number of just uh, robotic uh, drills uh, going around cones, doing simple things like that. Some of that has a place in skill acquisition. But the more that they can spend time making decisions all the time during practice, that starts to set up a lot of those patterns that they can call on in games and figure it out. And we'll talk about that in a little bit also how that affects their performance under pressure and, uh, and avoids things like choking. But does that answer your question, Stuart? I know it, there's no perfect answer of what they should be doing. I think the point of the book is helping coaches and parents understand what those developing brains are going through and then maybe being creative in themselves of, of how, to, uh, how to teach them better. In, in many ways, you may well have written you know the, the kind of uh, accompanying manual to this podcast <laughs> because um i i think um we you know one of the things that i've talked about a lot is um and, and you're probably aware that the, the concept of the drill and, and i did, did 
define the drill as being, you know, kind of an, an isolated, an isolated sort of decoupled practice that is, you know, taken away from the context. Um, uh, and I've been sort of challenging the whole coaching community for some time to sort of, uh, you know, kind of move away from from these ideas. Um, and part of the reason for that is, um, oh, it's twofold really. I mean, I'm, I'm really passionate about um, sports participation and and people and, and young people experiencing sport and and having a, a fantastic experience. But I'm also, sure. uh, yes, jump in. Oh, sorry. No, no, um, I just wanted to as you went on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I'm I'm um, I'm fascinated by that, but also I'm also interested in ha- in how people can improve and and and, uh, and enhance their capabilities and and uh, you know kind of go further than as, or explore the limits of their potential and that's what kind of talent equations is, is partly about but in my mind the the, the kind of the the dream or, or the ideal scenario is that we can do both things at the same time and um, for a long time I think the the view of or predominant view in coaching has been you kind of have to sacrifice one for the other so for example in order to get better sorry it's not always going to be fun you're going to have to do some boring repetitive things because otherwise you can't get better well I, I actually reject that hypothesis altogether because i believe in what you guys are talking about which is that if we create uh, learning environments where there are um problems to solve um, and actually, um, the problems are actually uh, require the individuals to make decisions in order to solve the problems. Um, then, um, and usually those uh, activities that have problems to solve, we can often call games. You know, games take many forms. They can be very small, very big, or or what have you, and they can have different kinds of numbers and space and everything else. If we can design those really great problem-solving environments where the individuals have to make collective and individual decisions in order to solve the problem, then we can get them to tap into this concept of the playmaker. And you know what the best thing about that is, is not only do they become far better at their ability to perform at the activity, but it's a real load of fun while you're doing it. And so that's yeah. why I'm so passionate about the whole whole mission. I, I I just kind of it feels to me like that. There's a that's a kind of central message for the book. Would that be fair? Yeah, absolutely. I I think that it's um, before you can improve. You know, game after game, uh, the the post mortem analysis is mental mistakes and uh, missed assignments, etc. And it's like, well, okay, if we're going to reduce those and we're going to make better decisions in games, then we have to look at the training and say, are we emphasizing those things? And the first thing that I think we're trying to do with our book is helping athletes, parents, and coaches understand a little bit more about the learning process, about the developing brain, the developing athlete, so that you know future volumes, future books, whatever can say, based on that knowledge, uh, we've been doing some things wrong. <laughs> and so let's adjust because we really need to teach the cognitive game in a different way. Um, one of the great, uh, another one of Glenn's contacts that we were very fortunate to interview is Dr. Anders Erickson, who, you know, long story short, uh, Malcolm Gladwell made him famous with his 10,000 hours uh, research And one of the things when we talked to Dr. Erickson about all of that is he said, of course, we, you know, there's been many books about that and many, many articles about the whole 10,000 hour thing. And he said that what keeps getting lost in the conversation is my main point, which was about deliberate practice and doing something for each individual that is specific to them so that they can get better. And rather than always just everybody's going to dribble around cones tonight because that's what I I've scheduled for practice. So that's what we're going to do, or everyone's going to do this drill. Uh, One of the quotes he told us that I'll I'll, uh, pass on here is he said, I'm basically arguing that when you look at a lot of the practice that I've seen visiting all sorts of different teams, very little of that is actually even getting close to this idea of individualized deliberate practice or somebody's doing something that is uniquely appropriate for them to improve some aspects of their performance. And so he's, he's saying, yeah, in the luxury of time, you know, a coach should have some type of individualized plan for each person on his team and should try to emphasize that with each person uh, 
it, it's a tall order because if, like you said, if you have 30 kids to coach tonight, do you really understand each of the 30 kids and what each one of them needs? And can you at attend to that? So it's a practical matter as well. But I think that's what he's saying with the deliberate practice concept to, to really understand it. Do you, do you agree with that, Stuart? Yeah, a hundred percent. And actually just talking about um, uh, Dr. Erickson, Erickson's work, I, I am, um, I mean, I, I, I was a, big fan of um of that research when it first came out and 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 still i still am in a, in a in a big way and i i think um you know some of the there's there's quite a big part of the sort of talent community that have become i think have sort of maybe unfairly treated the uh, the deliberate practice research because i think the sad thing for me about uh, the way um Malcolm Gladwell, uh, he called it a rule and then it became this idea that it became a bit of a mantra and it took off and everybody just started thinking, oh, right, well, we, it's all about the numbers. It's all about the hours. And, yeah. you know, and this idea of, you know, 9,999 hours, right, do one more and here comes the gold medal. And, and it just yeah. doesn't work like that. And I do know, I do know of, I have heard of anyway, uh, parents who are counting the hours on the fridge door. Um, but right. But that's because there's this perception that, you know, it, it takes 10,000. Now, look, so the message for me in that research is uh, practice quality matters, really matters. Um, and so actually creating the best kind of experience for individuals to learn within is really, really important. Secondly, um, to get good at anything is hard and it takes some time. The number is kind of irrelevant, but it takes time. Very few, very few people depending on domain of course but very few people literally become expert just like that it really r rarely happens apart from other 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 factors that 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 might come into play so um and, and so i think that's really really important and so going back to this point about practice quality and even talking about 30 kids i you know if i do a if i went to do a session tonight right and i had uh, 30 kids and i got them into you know kind of let's say groups of say five or six and they had to do they had to wait their turn to have their go at the activity we were going to do which didn't really have an outcome no problem to solve literally just repeating a movement pattern well not only would it be mind-numbingly boring and I would have an awful lot of behavioral challenges on my hands but secondly they wouldn't get many goes so I will design a session where yeah. they get maximum goes you know maximum opportunities and also maximum problems to solve because a there's an entertainment factor here and I don't want a load of um, under 11 boys giving me a load of hard time tonight. But secondly, I know that they're, but, but if they're engaged, they're also going to learn, which is one of the reasons we're so passionate about the methodology. So um, anyway, uh, Len, I just thought, you know, whether, what, what's your, what's your thoughts on, on all this? Well, it's so encouraging to hear you talk about how you structure your practices and working with young men and women uh, and getting them to, to, to solve problems. And one of the interesting things I found, I thought that perhaps we were just kind of barking in, in the dark here about this concept of the importance of our cognition. And yesterday I get a call after LinkedIn, when the book, when the book came out, uh, a gentleman called Kevin McGreskin, a coach from Scotland, who now lives in Toronto, bought the book and uh, contacted me. And but I appreciate the fact that you cited me in, in, in the book, and I'd forgotten that you had done that, but he talked about the importance of cognition. And so do you mind if I share my slides with you? And he, so he sent me his slides. So he prepared these about three or four years ago. And, and I'm amazed that the similarity of the 40-some slides, whatever he had in there, kind of matched up what we wrote about in the book. So I said, Dan, you know, there's other people thinking about this stuff too, uh, which is, you know, uh, I, I'm just so grateful for that, and so uh, wonderful to hear you talk about your, your emphasis in working with young men and women on uh, on training decision-making processes. I, I think that's so wonderful. So that, I just wanted to add that is that there are other people uh, that are out there, and I'm hoping that we'll all be we'll get into a kind of an exchange, a, a dialogue, if you will, and help spread the world uh, the word around the world, literally. I think that's um, that's exactly right. I mean, and, and the, the, one of the great things that um, I've found through uh, since I've been running the podcast um, is uh, how many people reach out to me saying, 
uh, things along those lines, you know, so, you know, saying things along the lines of, you know, this is really, you know, kind of um, resonated with me and as, as kind of connected with the, the approach that I'm trying to take. And, and it, it, you know, it's, it's empowered me to do more because I felt like it was just me um, or, you know, I, 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 I kind of, you know, so there's actually a quite a significant audience out there, a very receptive audience. So I think the book's coming out at exactly the right time because I think it's going to add a lot of uh, support to the work. Because what, 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 what's also happening, which is interesting, and I think this is where the book's very, very valuable, is um, because it, you, you've written it in such a way that it's accessible uh, to a, a wider range of people, um, you know, it's the sort of thing that maybe parents are going to pick up and understand because what a lot of people who, who contact me, they're at, one of the questions they ask is when they're doing their coaching session, because it doesn't look like what people assume a coaching session to be, i.e. very ordered, very structured, um, you know, kind of a lot of repetitive movement drills, this kind of stuff. When their sessions look a little bit more chaotic than that, because they're kind of a bit more game-like, there's a perception from parents that it's not really coaching. And so I think this book's going to really help them to understand what's, ha- you know, it's almost like when somebody comes along to question, what are you doing? Why aren't you coaching? You can always give them the book or give them a link to the book and say, look, just read that. And then you'll understand. Good, good. <laughs> we would well, love that. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And, and it's like uh, several uh, point of Mike Sullivan in his forward to our book called it the next frontier. And he's here as a professional coach saying that. And I, I just hope it gets traction. You know, it'd be nice to make a little profit off the book, but at this point in my career, I, I'm really interested in getting knowledge up to to uh, aspiring athletes, to young coaches, to, to parents, as you say. Uh, that this is important. Don't ignore it. And uh, I'm going to keep trying to spread the word uh, as long as I can. Fantastic. You know, so I was going to say a, an interesting story that um, one of the great sports science researchers we interviewed was uh, Dr. Damian Farrell from the Australian Institute of Sport. Yep. And, and in one of his presentations, he gave, I thought was a very uh, interesting uh, metaphor, if you will. He talked about Dr. Seuss books and he said, you know, if you read, everyone's read Dr. Seuss books to their kids. And he said, if you look at one of his books, green eggs and ham or whatever, have, whatever have you, he said, there's probably only, you know, 30 different words, 25 to 30 different words in the whole book. Mm -hmm. But what Seuss does is he keeps changing around the order of the words in different rhyming sequences. And just, he said, you know, when he he wrote the books, it was meant to help kids learn to read. So he kept the vocabulary small, but he just kept mixing them up. And eventually they see the words in different contexts and different orders and different sentences. And eventually they start to grasp the overall meaning of, of these sentences and these words, et cetera, and how you can move them. And, and Damon was advocating like practice should be like that, where keep the vocabulary simple, but just keep moving things around, different scenarios, different ways that they can see the game and situations so that they can learn that and develop that tacit knowledge to say, okay, I'm, I've seen that situation several different ways so that it's when they're in a game situation, which is never like practice, but now they're more malleable and they can say, all right, I've, I've seen some patterns like this before and I know what to do and I know how to react quickly to this changing pattern. I, I just, we just thought that was an interesting uh, way to look at it. I love that analogy, actually. Um, uh, and, I, and I think that resonates actually really uh, very strongly with um, – very much the the kind of approach that I think many people who listen to the podcast are, 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 are play are exploring, which is this idea that you know you can take one conceptual game, you know, one idea, um, and by um, manipulating the environment in certain ways through space or t- or the rules or um, or the number of players or what the players can do or the equipment that they're using, you can manipulate this in a very way. And so each time you get an enormous amount of variety. So the individuals, mm-hmm. you know, they, they feel like you know things are moving on and changing and this, that, and the other. But the reality is, is that actually the core concept that we're exploring is still the same concept. And um, right. so from a pure entertainment perspective, I think it's 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 engage it's very engaging. The the other piece I think that's very really important is is I I kind of. I look at the way I look at video games a lot at the moment and you see the way kids are very engaged in video games. And I looked at some of the research into that and uh, there was a, 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 a young female researcher called Amy Price who 
who came on to the podcast a, a number of um, months ago, who has been very influenced by the work, uh, Len, you'll probably be aware of the work of James G, who's looked at games for learning. And um, mm -hmm. looking at the art, the kind of architecture of game games as a means by which that we can help design our practices. So the idea, for example, of levels, you know, so uh, in level one, the game's very simple. And then at level two, it gets more complex. And at level three, it's even more complex again. And how can they navigate their way through these worlds or, or this idea of there's a game world and there's a mission to be solved, the mission to achieve. And how do we collaborate as a group to solve the mission? And um, funnily enough, tonight uh, it's uh, it's my last cricket session, um, and I was thinking to myself, how can I, how can I create like a really fun night? So you guys might be aware of the gigantic gaming phenomenon called Fortnite. Um, and mm -hmm. my, my little boys currently got a friend back from school. They've just finished term. They're currently next door, and uh, they're busily in this world together um you know kind of making all sorts of chaos and mayhem but when we go to play cricket tonight <laughs> we're going we're gonna to play a fortnight festival uh, where each of the each of the teams is going to be they're going to have a certain number of they're going to have different um like weapons they can use as cricketers and they're going to have a map that's going to be smaller and they're going to have different like, different challenges they're going to face and uh we'll see how it goes i'll i'll, uh, I'll let you know it's going to be a bit of an experiment but it should be some fun <laughs> And you know what's interesting, yeah, Stuart, is one, yeah. of the, one of the things we talk about in the book is uh, there's a, I'm located in Wisconsin, and there's a, a researcher at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Sean Green, who has done quite extensive research on the power of video games in learning and how, yes, playing video games uh, enhances and, and there is transfer for improving perceptual skills, uh, especially those fast-moving, action-paced games. Now, the, the violent conduct uh, content of them is not ideal for kids. But even playing a, you know, a, a FIFA game or an, a Madden game or whatever mm -hmm. puts them in that environment. They love the environment. Uh, they'll play it for hours. But there is some proof and some science behind playing these games within reason, <laughs> an hour to a day, yeah. um, can help perceptual skills that do transfer to other uh, areas of their life. And I think there's a lot of, and, and as Len mentioned earlier, there's a lot of technology coming out now that when they're off the field and they can't play their sport eight hours a day, but when they're off their field, what are some off the field technology options that can actually help them as well? Stuart, if I could circle back to that, to, to, just adding to what Dan is just talking you know, I meant to so we'd come back to it, but uh, no. now that you mentioned cricket also, is that one of the things that I've been involved with, and Dan's very much aware of uh, the, uh, the use of occlusion that really kind of, uh, got, it's a great start for Bruce Abernathy in Australia, and Damien yeah. Farrell has followed up with that, uh, and using the method of occlusion to teach uh, decision making, and it varies, of course, depending on the sport, but we we have developed a, an app uh, that can be used on tablets and phones to do pitch recognition in baseball and softball. And, and uh, we've done it also with cricket uh, in Australia. And uh, it's, you know, it's a very specific form of, uh, of uh, decision making. It has to be done very fast because of the speed of the, of the ball in, in cricket or, or pitch in baseball. Uh, so the method of occlusion, I think it is really going to become popular, uh, not only with decision-making, that very specific kind of decision-making, but we're looking to expand it into uh, other decisions that have to be made on the pitch uh, or on the ice rink or on the basketball court, wherever it might be, uh, where highly probable situations uh, occur, and just train uh, young athletes to, to, to make decisions, because they've seen it before. They've learned how to pick up cues. And, and know what is the best decision to be made. So, yeah, the, the whole method of occlusion uh, that uh, we use with the, uh, uh, the game sense, uh, the website's called Game Sense, uh, and we hope to expand into other areas. But the other um, device that I started using in professional hockey uh, about 2010 when it first came out, and I know Manchester United is also using it in, in, in football, uh, is the Neuro Tracker, which is multiple object tracking, developed by a good friend of mine at the University of Montreal, who's a world-class scientist. Uh, uh, where uh, it's not specific to any sport, but it, it it it's a perceptual device that really helps you focus attention, track objects in multi-dimensional space. 
and it started with a big cave concept, and now they've got it down onto small devices, and uh, it has very similar kinds of effects. So I think technology is going to make a big difference on how we train uh, perception and cognition in the near future, and we're just going to get better at doing that. I think it's um, it's, it's a fascinating space, isn't it? And I think, um, you know, I'm, I know you've been on... Um... Uh, you've been on Rob Gray's podcast and uh, you know Rob and I are kind of I suppose the podcast collaborators as well I sort of feel as if like you know his podcast which is looking at the scientific side and I'm sort of looking at the practice side Um, and I know you guys are talking about that and he's he's very he's very much exploring that kind of uh, that technological side and the role of technology in um, in in kind of decision making and and learning and i think it's kind of a very interesting space and i'm i'm very much trying to stay close to it because i think as our as our ability to sort of explore with things like virtual reality and all those sorts of things and augmented reality i think it's going to get going to get better and better um so just sure. I, i'm just i'm just conscious that um you know you guys are uh, i know you're very busy and um and also uh, i know i've also got to get myself prepared for this um uh, <laughs> yeah. this crazy experience that's going to happen later on so um just wanted to you know uh, round off the conversation really by just saying are there any other things that you think that are, are worth worthy of mention uh, that you know other people might find in the book that we haven't yet covered I, I, one in particular i think might be worth interesting is you definitely start talking about some of the motivational concepts that I'm also very interested in, like, you know, mindset, grit, those sorts of areas. Um, you know, what is there for people to learn about that? Uh, and how does this relate to the whole decision-making concept? Well, I, I think if I could just do a quick uh, take at this is it's, uh, you know, in uh, the brain, the brain has the kind of the cognitive com- component and we, we refer to that typically as intelligence and it's nothing more, nothing less. Uh, but there's also a concept that's, that uh, a number of individuals have kind of developed over the last several decades, getting more of the, the emotional intelligence, you know, which is, uh, again, something regulated by the brain. Uh, but it's an important part of this, and, and uh, we call it emotional intelligence. It's uh, making smart decisions emotionally. And so we devoted the latter part of the book to, to get into that area uh, more with the motivational end, the, uh, the, the concepts such as mindset and mental toughness and grit, uh, the phenomenon of choking, all those things that kind of uh, in, involve the emotional system. So uh, uh, we don't, we didn't want to leave that uh, uh, empty. So we we discussed that as well. It's an important part of uh, making effective decisions and how the two relate to how emotions can. Uh, impact on the cognitive system. Dan, you may want to elaborate on that a bit too. Yeah, and Stuart, the whole third part of the book is devoted to that um, because, you know, you, you picture those athletes, young athletes out in the field, and it, there's so much pressure on them these days. And I think we, we just thought it was very important for parents to learn more about that from a science-based perspective about automaticity, about, and, and you mentioned Rob Gray, all the great work he's done with Dr. Bylock on choking and why athletes choke. And so much of it is uh, the pressure that they feel when they're out there performing. They have coaches yelling at them. They have parents yelling at them, et cetera. And to, for, again, for more of an educational thing of, hey, parents, hey, coaches, this is what happens when you, you know, yell at your kids during a game whether it be you're yelling negative things or you're yelling instructive things, do this, pass here, do that, uh, to break down some of the, the cognitive processes of when they're out in the field chasing a ball and they're trying to concentrate and focus on what they're trying to do, all of these other distractions are out there and just what happens in the brain and, and what the research shows as far as basically the bottom line is you're not helping them. and the best thing would be positive cheering. But again, it's until parents and coaches read some of that and say, you know, it's not just us saying you shouldn't yell at your kids. It's no, you're actually hurting their performance by doing that and you're not helping them. So it was just important to us to kind of cover some of these popular concepts, mindset, grit, choking. Actually, Dr. Christian Swan, we talked to in Australia, he's doing some great research on clutch performances uh, kind of the opposite of choking. Why do some athletes perform better under pressure? 
uh, and what some of the what does the science say about that? So yeah, it's just uh, it's a good way to wrap up the book and uh, and the conversation. Fantastic. Um, so guys, um, I, I imagine there'll be people out there who'd like to get in touch. Uh, you know, maybe find out more. I, I maybe get you guys to come along and kind of you know walk them through it and 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 maybe even help them with some of their support to develop develop coaches. How do they reach out to you to uh, to do so? Well, thanks, Stuart. Yeah. So Len and I. Uh, work together. Uh, we have a website, 80percentmental.com. That's eight, the number is eight zero. And then the words percentmental.com. And also, uh, as I mentioned, the, the book is coming out, officially released by Simon & Schuster in the UK on August 9th. It's up on Amazon now, available for pre-release. Uh, we have a hardcover, we have an ebook version and an audio version as well. But yeah, Len and I, you know, Len's in Florida, I'm in Wisconsin, but we're more than happy to do phone calls like this with teams and coaches uh, to answer questions, uh, anything really to help them. But, um, you know, a great place to start would just be with the book. And then if they, uh, we do work with some of these technology companies uh, for solutions, we do work on uh, speaking opportunities, et cetera. So yeah, we're happy to help however we can. Fantastic stuff. Well, look, I'm, I'm massively appreciative of, you, of your time, and, uh, and and thanks for coming on and, and sharing some of the some of the insights from the book. I know, I know many of the people on the um, uh, you know who, who listen in will be eagerly eagerly waiting to get hold of it once it once it lands. So, uh, and it'd be nicely in the middle of the summer holidays. So, I think uh, for a number of people, it'll become um, you know important holiday reading. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and, and all the best with it. And I do hope that um, that uh, you know we that you know we we can get the message out there, get more coaches, more parents, and more people bought into this, so that they can understand a little bit more about what what makes a great learning experience for young people. So I'm like I said before, I'm really appreciative that you've you've taken the time to to actually put the whole thing out there because I know how hard it can be. Uh, I've I've tried to have considered writing a book a couple of times, and it's one of those things that I think. Uh, you know, it, people think that it's a really, it's a really uh, simple thing to do, but it's a far greater <laughs> undertaking. And, and I know that for sure. So uh, again, once again, I'm really appreciative of you uh, sharing, sharing your experiences today and also um, with the book. And I, and I hope you all the best for the future. Thank you, Stuart. Thanks so much, Stuart. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Talent Equation podcast. If you like the show, then please consider supporting it by leaving a review on your favorite podcast player, telling your friends about it, or even becoming a hero and show your appreciation by becoming a patron. Just head over to thetalentequation.co.uk and click on the Becoming a Patron button at the top of the page. Wow. What a great conversation that was. Um just just great to actually get those guys on board um i heard them talking on uh, rob gray's podcast and i thought yeah they, I've, I've got to i've got to get them on and, uh, and let them talk about you know how the books come about and all that sort of stuff i, I mean I'm, I'm genuinely um appreciative of the fact that they've, they've put this piece of work together uh, dan in particular you know to go from working in different environments that of the other and you know, to just be a, you know, becoming a, a passionate sports dad and then thinking to himself, well, actually, you know, maybe I can make a contribution to this literature, getting together with a researcher. You've got the researcher practitioner piece and they put together a, a great piece of work and, a, and it's really valuable for everybody out there who's, who's working with young people, navigating some of these challenges, but really looking into the, you know, the beyond the pitch, the, all the other things that are going to help them to drive performance and also navigate their way through the complexities of of modern life so yeah uh, fantastic piece of work and well done well done to them both um as always i uh, hope you've enjoyed uh, if you're enjoying the podcast and uh, and you want to you want to get get on board and support a number of ways you can do that obviously reviews are brilliant if you, if you take the time to leave a review it always helps lets other people know what the podcast is all about uh, if you want to get a bit further into it and really become a, an active supporter, uh, there's a number of ways of doing that. Uh, there's a patron button on the, on, uh, at the top of the page on the homepage of the website, talentequation.co.uk. There's also a PayPal button now. Uh, and a number of people have come on board and joined the, the learning group that I run called the Conclave, which meets on a monthly basis online, challenges, challenges each other to learn and find new ways of doing things. So uh, if you want to get on board with that, then then by all means do. Looking forward to learning with you. And in the meantime, ditch those drills.